What I'm going to spend a lot of time on is the subtalar joint. That's the joint between the talus and the calcaneus. And this joint controls the way force passes from the body into the foot and from the foot back into the body. And it moves around an axis in the open chain. The subtalar joint axis, as defined by root, orient, and weed, goes from dorsal anterior medial to plantar posterior lateral. In three dimensions, it looks like this. So if you have an axis that's askew to all three planes, the motion around that axis will occur in all three planes. So we get the motions of pronation and supination. Pronation involves dorsiflexion, eversion, external rotation, and supination is plantar flexion, inversion, internal rotation. It's easy to remember because it's the same in the hand. It's the way we carry soup, is supination. I'm from Nashville. Do you know how to find a songwriter in Nashville? You go like this. Waiter? Those are, those are people that didn't remember supination. <laughs> so here's the motions of pronation and supination. There's supination and pronation. So you're moving around all three cardinal body planes. The first thing I want you to note is that in the closed chain, the foot does not move around an axis. Easy to tell that because if you were moving around an axis, the ground would have to be moving. And unless you're in California, the ground is fairly stable. So we get motions of pronation and supination in the closed chain, that is when the foot's on the ground, by moving the bones in relationship to each other. We're going to take a close look at this subtalar joint. And it's a three-faceted joint. There's a posterior, a middle, and an anterior facet. What I want you to note is that that middle facet sits out on a shelf of bone that extends out the medial side of the calcaneus called the sustentaculum tali. It sustains or holds up the talus. And it acts as a lever arm. If you want to understand subtalar joint motion, you have to look at the geometry of each one of these three facets. And we're going to begin with the posterior facet. Now the posterior facet is more or less the shape of, of a coffee cup. Let's take a look. Can you see that? It's a small section of a cone with the smaller part of the cone pointing medially toward the middle facet. Well, what is the axis of this shape? It's right down the middle. How can you possibly move around this shape? Well, you can slide on it or you can rotate around it. And in fact, we do both. We rotate and slide. If you rotate and slide, you get what we call a screw-like or helicoidal motion. And that's as far as the literature goes, but it's not far enough. Because although both motions do occur, they don't occur simultaneously. In other words, when you first hit the ground, you're hitting the ground in supination. Plantar flexed, inverted, internally rotated. The head of the talus is externally rotated in relationship to the calcaneus. So the head of the talus is sitting on the anterior facet. So when you hit the ground, the calcaneus is stopped by friction, unless you're in Minneapolis in the middle of the winter, like I was last winter. My calcaneus wasn't stopped by friction. It was so cold, I think I saw a lawyer with his hands in his own pockets. <laughs> the calcaneus was stopped by friction. The momentum is coming down the leg it's, it hits this cone-shaped posterior facet. You want to rotate around it, but you can't. Why can't you go around the posterior facet? Because the head of the talus is sitting on the anterior. So you cannot rotate. If you can't rotate, what are you going to do? You're going to slide. In what direction? You're going to slide in the direction of the axis, the axis of the posterior facet, which points forward and medial, not accidentally, right at the base of the middle facet. So the first motion that occurs at heel contact 
is actually a forward medial slide along the posterior facet toward the middle facet. So your center of gravity is moving forward and medial onto the middle facet. And as you put force on this lever arm, what's going to happen? The calcaneus will begin to evert. But the key that unlocks the door is this tiny little anterior facet. If you were to take a coffee stirrer and paste it onto the anterior facet and level it, you would notice that the calcaneus was inverted, in inversion. Inversion is part of supination. How do we hit the ground? In supination. So the momentum of the human body is coming down, hitting a level anterior facet. Will that cause you to pronate or supinate? Neither one. Do an experiment. Get up some speed and run straight into the wall. Are you going to bounce left or right? You'll bounce back. So running into a level anterior facet does not encourage you to pronate or supinate until we slide forward and medial, load the middle facet, begin to evert the heel. As we evert the heel, we tilt the anterior facet. Let's take a look. As you evert the heel, the anterior facet will tilt. And what was happily sitting on this level anterior facet? It was the head of the talus. So suddenly it begins to tilt, and the head of the talus slides down that facet like a kid going down a playground slide. What happens when your kid reaches the bottom of the slide? My kids were this big, they'd say, fall down, go boom. That's what happens. The head of the talus literally falls off the anterior facet and is now free to rotate around the cone-shaped posterior facet. And that's how pronation occurs. And that's why we have a big hole in our foot. There's a great big hole in the middle of your foot called the sinus tarsi. Why would you have a hole in the middle of your foot? So that as you pronate, you can close the hole. It obliterates as we pronate. It's funny, we figured that out when I was in uh, podiatry school. Not we, but someone figured it out and said, ah, there's your answer. We'll stuff things into the hole. And we started stuffing first silastic rubber and then titanium. And thank goodness that fell out of favor for about 17 years until they came out with the giant screw. Take this giant screw and you put it in the hole and it blocks pronation. Blocks pronation. Pronation is an important part of the gait cycle. You don't want to block pronation. You want to control pronation. The tailor head slides down this tilted anterior facet. What you're th seeing here is a three-dimensional animation of this occurring. Let's look at this from a different angle. The tailor head sliding down this tilted anterior facet and falling off. This wasn't a new concept. In fact, if you read Root, Orion, and Weed, they have this in their textbook. Here's the head of the talus sitting on a level anterior facet. Here's sliding down a tilted anterior facet, and here it is disarticulated. What I also want you to notice is this vertical distance. You can change the, the height of the dome of the talus up to three quarters of an inch during pronation. So how do we measure limb length discrepancy? From the medial malleolus to the umbilicus? And yet you could have three quarters of an inch of limb length discrepancy occurring below the medial malleolus. Something to think about. When you put pronation and supination together in all three planes, it looks like this. And here it is, the entire foot pronating and supinating. Why is this so important? How does this affect the way we walk? Let's take a look. Let's see how this affects the gait cycle. We're going to begin the gait cycle with heel strike. And we heel strike in supination. Plantar flexed, inverted, internally rotated. That's why we wear out the outside of our shoe. Patient comes in and says, I'm wearing out the outside of my shoe. I say, good for you. That's a good thing. 
What I want you to observe is that the axis of the subtalar joint actually exits the foot on the plantar posterior lateral side of the heel right at the point of heel